Tim Schenk. I'm an associate scientist here at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I'm a, uh, a deep sea biologist in the biology department here. Prior to, to the discovery of hydrothermal vents in Galapagos, it was widely held that life really didn't exist without the use of the sun. Um, that in, in the deep sea, animals survived off of um, organic debris that would fall, it would rain down, and it fed the animals that were on the bottom. But no, vents changed all of that. But there was nutrients coming up from inside the earth that they could make use of. They didn't really need the sun, except for some oxygen. These vent systems were first discovered in Galapagos in 1977 by a team of geologists. Uh, it wasn't until 1979 that the biologists got to go back and study these uh, unique animals that were found there. They didn't anticipate finding these animals um, on the rift. Uh, they were looking for where heat would be coming out of the Earth's crust. Um, lo and behold, they found these unique life forms that, that were found only there. We're talking about 10 foot long tube worms that have no mouth, no eyes, no gut. Um, they seem to have a, a sack of bacteria in them uh, that they use for nutrition. The bacteria convert chemi chemistry that's in the fluids um, into energy that the tube worm can use. And a variety of, of hydrothermal vent life have, have used this strategy, have evolved this strategy. Once they found Galapagos vents in 1977, it wasn't long before the next site was found, just uh, north of there um, in 1979. Then again in the, in the Gulf of California in 1981, and then um, off of Oregon and Washington in 1984. Uh, 1985 came the first vents in the Atlantic. It was a rapid succession of discoveries that took place that still have us reeling in some ways. If I tell you that we've, we now know of over 600 species that live in vents around the world, that's almost a new discovery of event species every week and a half for 30 years. I mean, it's tremendous. So along the East Pacific rise, along um, South America, uh, down from Galapagos Islands, we find those areas dominated by tomb worms, large clams, mussels. Um, if we go up north uh, off of the coast of Oregon and Washington, the ridge system up there has tomb worms, and some clams, different species of worms, that they're just a little bit different than what we see in the, in the, in the, in the, the, southern, to the south, southern area of the Pacific. And one of the key places to go was the Arctic Ocean. It's a, it's a fantastic evolutionary setting. Um, it's, a, it's a virtually enclosed basin. It has, a, um, you can, water can flow in and out on a shallow uh, level. Um, to the Fram Strait on the Atlantic side, to the Bering Sea on the Pacific side, um, but there's very little deep water connection. And that basin's been closed for about 28 million years. So whatever's been in there, evolving along that Gackle Ridge where we're going, has been doing so for the last 28 million years or so in, in total isolation. What's it gonna look like? I can tell you right now, I have no idea what the animals are going for. But it, I, it's safe to say that if they're there, they're going to have novel adaptations. They're going to have to do things that we may not even know about yet. They're living off resources and nutrients that we haven't discovered yet. So it's a dream for an evolutionary biologist like myself to be able to go there and find those animals. This podcast was produced by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution with funding from the National Science Foundation. For more information, visit us on the web at polardiscovery.whoi.com dot edu